Good afternoon in, in South Africa. Um, good morning, some other parts of the world. Um, welcome to this afternoon, this Friday, Navigating the Blizzard webinar. Um, we're doing an interesting topic today. And as you can see from the, from the title or the header, it's called something a little bit cryptic. It's called 15940.2. And some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about. But what I want to do is I want to use an example, this example of an event that happened last year, which was really something to behold. Um, I, I was reminded of it. I was, you know, um, sitting one Saturday morning and thinking about the fact that I'd heard about this event that was happening. Um, and being uh, almost an almost ex runner, um, I thought, let me actually watch this. Let me see what it's about. Let me think, think about it. And what it was, was an attempt at defeating, breaking, smashing the barrier of two hours to run 42.2 kilometers standard marathon distance um, and so i was fascinated having run in my past a number of years ago i've completed a couple of comrades marathons in south africa um, i'd completed a number of marathons a number of half marathons it was never fantastic but i've got a few sub 14 minute 10 kilometers a couple of sub 90 minute half marathons under my, under my belt. And so for me, it was really interesting to say, well, here is an event, um, a barrier that has stood almost like the, the four minute mile, um, which had been obviously an incredible, an incredible um, you know, barrier that had been broken in the 60s already. And so it was this, this event that was similar to that. And here was a, a, an attempt um, to break through this barrier of sub two hours for 42.2 kilometers and having run that distance it was something that really caught my attention and obviously when I watched it which I did from beginning to end I started to think and reflect and have subsequently thought and reflected much on how the event was made possible through good governance and good implementation through good thinking good planning um, and that's what I want to unpack a little bit for you in today's in today's webinar. So it's, it's a little bit different from from the previous webinars. And what we've seen, it also touches on a number of themes that we've seen emerging over the over the period of the last ten or twelve weeks um, since we've had lockdowns. We're seeing concurrently all over the world a whole range of case studies unfolding of leadership, of governance, of decision making, of policy, all of those things that speak into these three emerging topics or themes that we have been and are going to continue focusing on as, as time goes on moving forward. This theme of strategy, how do we actually move forward? Um, and the challenge of the, of the world today is that no one's been where we need to go. No one has actually been through what we're going through at the moment. We're all at the same point. We're at different stages in it, but internationally, this thing is happening that is challenging every single one of us. In not just our strategy, but also our structure. So the structures we have in place are structures that were designed with a previous way of doing things in, um, in place. And so what we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, the, 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 the structure elements is to really think and say, well, how do, we, how do we ensure that, how do we allow and how do we address some of the structural issues that we are being faced with at this time as well? And then leadership is that one of the other themes that we're seeing, and again, uh, number of case studies in terms of leadership and different styles of leadership different types of leadership and each of us individually and together is um is being challenged significantly in terms of our own leadership and the leadership of the organizations that we that we actually run and um and and, and govern and manage as we move forward and so this webinar is designed as a, as a working webinar um i've got the q and a's in front of me as we go through this this interesting um this interesting you know topic and theme and uh, as i unpack it please ask questions um put anything in the chat box as um as 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 well and this is really an opportunity and and for me as i mentioned it was an opportunity to really think about to reimagine the future reimagine the way things are into you know the the way forward looking at an event a challenging time where there's been a huge amount of effort and a huge amount of emphasis on how do we break through some of the barriers that, that were faced in athletics and in marathon running, but certainly in our businesses, we are facing massive, massive barriers. And the event, obviously the man I'm talking about, um, a man who is famous around the world because he is 
you know, just an incredible, phenomenal, phenomenal athlete, um, Elliot Kipchoge. And here he is as he is actually running over the line. And I remember just the emotion of watching this man. And there you can see are a group of the bigger group that actually helped him um, accomplish this, this task. Um, and this was an incredible event because it was something, and obviously it's not a world record. It's not, you know, one of those things. It's not an official marathon. Um, it was a man aiming, attempting to break a significant barrier um, through just by being, a phenomenal, by being a phenomenal athlete. But the interesting thing is he didn't do it alone and he didn't do it randomly. It was an event which was well structured and well, well thought about. And at the end of it, he stood there and he said, I'm the happiest man in the world to be the first person to run under two hours. And I can tell people that no human is limited. And that's his, you know, his, his hashtag, no human is limited. Um, really thinking that everything we face today is overcomable if we reimagine the way forward and thinking about that. So for him as a runner, and he, he developed through the running ranks. He was a middle distance runner, a track runner and eventually ran his first half marathon and then marathon and, and has pretty much dominated the world in terms of, you know, marathon running. Um, but he's, he has this attitude and he reflects it here that no human is limited. In other words, he knows that he's broken a barrier. He knows that he's broken a, a significant, he's smashed a barrier and a boundary. And he then says, I expect more people all over the world to run under two hours after today. And ironically, within a couple of days, same weekend, I think, that he ran the woman's, um, woman's record, I think, was you know, pretty much um, broken at, a, in, at a, marathon, a marathon distance in the, real, in the real world. And so what I want to do is I want to unpack this and look at you know, this barrier. So the aim was to get under two hours. He ran the race in one hour, 59, 40.2 seconds. And the amazing thing is the speed at which, at which he did it. So what I want to do is unpack with a view to, and as I said, it's a slightly different webinar, to look at the barrier that they faced, or he faced, the champion himself and some thoughts around, around that, and then the elements of how they went about, and it was they went about putting together a plan and implementing a plan to smash this barrier. And then I wanna pick up on that and ask you the questions. What's the barrier you're facing? What's the significant thing in your industry, in your sector, or even just during this time that you need to get through to be successful? What is there in your team? Because the champion was only a champion, as you'll see in a, the next few minutes, because the champion was surrounded by an incredible team of, of, of amazing, amazing athletes. Um, and then what were the elements that were thought about? And so I do want to unpack this incredible 159 event for you, but also reflect on it very strongly in terms of what that means to us in our businesses. And so this webinar is is more about asking questions in a sense than about providing a whole lot of things, but helping you think through some of the barriers that we are, that, that, that we are facing. And so the barrier itself, 42.2 kilometers. As I mentioned, I have a couple of um, sub 90 minute, you know, half marathons under my belt from many years ago. And so I was a fairly reasonable, you know, runner, but I did find that the 42K distance was, was a significantly different, it isn't just double 21Ks. It, I always joke and say, for me, um, as someone who ran regularly and attempted a number of these, the halfway point for me was at the 32K mark, because there's a significant difference between, you know, as you increase your distance in running. And so here we have this distance and to run that distance you have to run every single kilometer at less than three minutes per kilometer and so i think i could do that possibly get close to the three minutes but to break that and to break it consistently for 42 kilometers at 250 you know two minutes 56 seconds per kilometer it's running 422 17 second 100 meter sprints in a row I mean, that's phenomenal. And so you can see there is this barrier. And I think the challenge is we look at these things and we think, is it possible? Is it possible? And it takes people like an Elliot Kipchoge, who is a phenomenal athlete. Um, as I've said there, there are, there are far too many achievements. He has far too many achievements to, to, um, to list. He was born in 84, he's 35 years old. He was the marathon and he is the current marathon world record holder. And so 
the marathon runners have been edging closer and closer and closer to this elusive two hour mark. Um, I remember a few years ago when the very first person ran a half marathon, 21.1 kilometers distance, under one hour. And that's when I was running was one of the big, the big barriers, which has subsequently obviously been broken. And ironically, Elliot Kipchoge ran his very first half marathon. He debuted his half marathon at that time you see there for 21.1 case, 59 minutes and 25 seconds, which means when he started extending his distance, there was this, this, this sparkle, this flickering that here was an incredible, incredible champion in the making. Um, and he has dedicated his life to running. He runs a, he runs a, um, a running camp and he runs out of that in, in, in Kenya. He's a, obviously Kenyan. Um, and he is a champion in, in Kenya. Traveling to Kenya was, was amazing because I was in Kenya the week after this 159 event. Um, and I unpacked some of what I'm unpacking in this webinar to a group I was with. And it was just this incredible wave of euphoria because here was a man who had shared his victory with, with, with everybody. As he said in his quote, I'm sure that other people will do it after me. And this is the, this is the wonderful thing about, about champions and about barriers is that they recognize that even though they're the first, they won't be the, they won't be the last. And so in our businesses, when we're looking at the barriers we face and the teams we have, remember that every single thing that has been implemented in your business, someone thought about, they thought about it, they planned it, they, they conceived it, they imagined it. And we'll touch on that as we as we go so to put the barrier and the champion together you also need a plan to break this barrier um, and so it's really interesting when you read and when you research and when you look at the videos um, and i remember being struck when i watched this event unfold about the fact that there were a lot of different aspects to this attempt to break this barrier there were the clear external and internal conditions that had to be matched and chosen um, things you know, like where it was held. It had to be planned meticulously. Plus there was also a previous attempt. So this was also not the first time that this had been attempted. And that's really significant because a lot of us face a challenge, face a barrier, see a barrier, try to overcome it, and we don't. And so we stop. And that's one of the biggest challenges in our businesses is if we have a barrier that we don't get through, we do need to reflect and look and say, how do we change the way we approach it? And you'll see there were some significant differences between the way that the attempt was attempted or the, the barrier was attempted in 2017, where was the previous event in 2019. And so there was a gap of two years between these two, these two attempts. A significant part of it was also the team. And the team was a big team. It wasn't only about one man. One man took the glory and one man obviously did the whole thing, but there was a team that was really well structured. And so the structure of the team, the team was handpicked and well structured. And then the meticulous implementation of how they went about overcoming this barrier was absolutely incredible to, to, to watch and, and behold. And so if we look at each of those um, and understand the internal and external conditions, there was a concerted effort to, to use a phrase we've been using in, in Sadar for the last, the last two, three months, is control the controllables. Whatever you can control, control. And so this is the approach they took. Is they said, how do we find a place that firstly is in the same time zone as Kenya? So if there's traveling, because there would be traveling, it can be as, you know, as undisruptive as, as, as possible. Also, what is the ideal temperature? Those of you who who run know that there's this ideal temperature of running where you're you're not freezing cold and you're not you know your body gets to this point of of of, of monitoring and in south africa we've we've started exercising after, after lockdown in pretty much those temperatures I, I know that i've run a couple of mornings when it's been between seven and nine degrees and it's not great to start but after a while it becomes very very comfortable to run in that and that obviously is time of day in other words there was really this let's look around the world at where we can find a place. And they found the place in Vienna, Austria. Um, and they found an incredible you know, route where a couple of things were, were in it. Number one, you can see from the route, there was a start, there was one turn, and then there were these 9.6 kilometer laps that were run. So each of the distances between those two roundabouts that you can see on the ends there was 4.3 kilometers. Across the 9.6 kilometers, there was a difference in elevation 
of 2.4 meters. So that's 2.4 meters over 9,600 meters, which is pretty much as flat as you're going to get. All right. And so there was never any uphill or downhill because those are things that can slow us down. Um, there was also, interestingly enough, the two circles were both big enough so that they didn't disrupt the running pattern. Because those of you who also run know that when you're going around a corner, that's what made running around our garden so frustrating, as we did in South Africa during, during you know, March and April. Um, and because you couldn't take 10 steps without having to turn a corner. And so it was really, really frustrating. Here there was a, there was a route, um, straight lines between two nice wide broad um, circles that could be navigated without breaking any any pace it was also tree lined because obviously when one runs and there is wind it's going to affect the running and so the conditions the venue was absolutely perfect they also chose the time of year where the temperature was right and they earmarked an eight day window in other words if the weather wasn't perfect on day one they would wait so pretty much like we've seen recently with the space launch where they were waiting for not just the ideal, they had the ideal place, but also the ideal conditions um, before they actually pulled the trigger on this, on this, this, whole, this whole event. Um, and so in our businesses, we've got to ask the question, you know, what can we control? And a lot of it is outside of our control. But even through what we're going through, there are things we can control. We can choose where we're going to do our business. We can choose some of the conditions. We can think about some of those ideal areas as, as well. And we'll unpack those in a few minutes' time. The planning. The planning was absolutely meticulous. And it was based on the fact that there had been this previous attempt, which had been meticulously planned. So it was in 2017. The target of two hours was missed by 25 seconds. So they ran in two hours and 25 seconds. And it was structured in a completely different way. A couple of things from that attempt. Firstly, it was on a racetrack. So they chose what was, they chose pretty much a, um, a, a racetrack, um, a car racetrack to, to race around. Again, very, very flat, very, very, you know, consistent road conditions. They chose a place very well. The format though was a, a completely different format. It, it was run as a race. There were three runners. Elliot Kipchoge was by far the better runner of the three and, and won the attempt in a sense. Um, but one of the things which was really, really interesting was that it was also behind closed doors. And you'll see in a couple of minutes time that that was one of the things that Elliot Kipchoge was insistent about. Is he said, I need the crowds. Um, and sometimes in our own businesses, we have to ask, well, what did we try before? And what can we learn from that? So the format was, was, was not great for a breaking to our attempt because it was a certain type of structure and it was used because that was what people were used to doing. So the way you broke records and have broken records pretty much since time immemorial in a race is you put the runners on a track and you see who can, who can win. Um, and yet there's a difference between running a race to win against other people versus running a race or running to break a time barrier. There's a different challenge involved because it has a whole lot of different elements to it. It's, it's less of a race challenge and it's more of a, an intangible, you know, barrier that, barrier that lies there. Um, and with that in mind, they said, well, firstly, let's change the format. So let's rethink completely how we're going to run this thing. Let's rethink it from the ground up, not a race. They changed from competition to collaboration. So instead of, and certainly in the first, in the first attempt, there were pacemakers, which was a standard thing, you know, where a pacemaker, how, how pacemaking works in the, you know, in, in normal racing is you find someone, they still have to start, all right, they have to begin with you, but they run to a certain distance. And so you'll find people who can, um, who can, you know, for over shorter periods, who can, so shorter distances set very, very good times and they become the pacemakers to pull and keep pulling the runners, the runners forward. But there are flaws in that system because what happens if your pacemakers get tired? Because they've still had to run from the beginning. And obviously there are rules and regulations around this in, in the, real, the real world of running. But what was different is they said, how can we change from a competition to a collaboration? And I was, how can we get as many people who are available to help Elliot Kipchoge break this barrier. 
because he couldn't do it on his own in a sense he had pacemakers but couldn't do it as, on his own and then they changed the environment Elif Kipchoge himself said I need I want the crowds um, and so they used the learning because he said I get my energy from there I'm I'm used to racing in front of crowds I get my energy I get inspired I'm doing it in a sense for myself but I'm also doing it for the for the world and so he wanted to share in the excitement and those of you who watched would have known that there was this incredible vibe incredible buzz as he got closer and closer to breaking this this the, the barrier and so the learning meant that there was far better decision making but it was also different decision making even that shift from competition to collaboration was a significant change of thinking in how in how they they went about the the second attempt so that was the thinking and the planning and the, the 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 key elements internal and external that had to be thought about there was then the key of the team and the team consisted of two two parts there was the back office team in a sense and all of our all of our businesses run with a back office team people who who are the experts in certain areas and so we have physiotherapists we have a nutrition expert we have a physician, all of these different people who were very, very experienced in their specialist areas, but who all got together and collaborated, not for themselves, but for this, this other person, Elliot Kipchoge, who was able to, 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 to run. And obviously there was history. Um, you can see the lead coach was someone who knew, you know, they all knew him. There was a relationship. And then alongside this back office team that was, was, planning it and putting it together and working out all the decision making there was what I call the front office team and so often there's this emphasis on the one person so Elliot Kipchoge is obviously there in white but there were 41 top world-class athletes that helped him break this barrier in other words there was a significant team and all of them what is interesting most of them and certainly of those crowd there were there were mountain runners and track athletes there were 5000 meter runners there were 10000 meter runners there were a number of them from his own training camp who were just phenomenal phenomenal athletes but remember all of these athletes had to be able to maintain the right pace not necessarily for as long as Elliot Kipchoge but certainly for the time necessary and all of them actually most of them are better than him at what they do in other words, the 5,000 meter world champs are far better at the 5,000 meters than, than Elliot Kipchoge because his distance is different. The 10,000 meters, certainly he'll give them a run for their money, but most of them were far better than him at the areas they specialize in. And that's a big question to ask about, about our teams as well, is what is, what is their specialty? What are, what are we, you know, what can we still get from them? Because all of them also, which was most important, none of them, no one of them were there for themselves, all right? Um, and that's important because if we think about a company and a, you know, organizational structures, the thing we often emphasize is that there is this other person involved, this other you know, legal person involved. The person of the company is the one that actually must do the best. And, and the team that supports it, that makes it happen, are all specialists in their own right. But when they combine their specialty in the right formation and structure it's not about them it's about it's about the other person and so all of them were willing to take the back seat in the sense all of them champions in their own right but in this case they were willing to put their effort and so you had this incredible team almost 50 people who were there not for themselves they were there for someone else um, you then had an incredible structure and so what was amazing for me as i watched it and this is where my, in a sense, filter and in inverted commas of governance thinking and board level, you know, work, where I started to say, well, actually, how are they doing this? And the most interesting thing was that there was this interesting formation. So this is literally off the, off the starting blocks. Um, you had teams of seven runners um, with Elliot Kipchoge at all times. You had a team around him at all times, and they were running in a very specific formation. What was interesting to me is, you know, logically thinking actually the, there's a formation, a V-shape, you know, we see the birds in the sky, we, we know when we're running, there's often a V-shape forms. There was an inverse V that formed um, and it was called a K formation. Two gentlemen, two runners behind, behind Elliot Kupchoge and then a, an inverted V in front of him forming this K, K formation. And that, that was a scientifically defined and described formation because what it did is it created a bubble 
that protected and carried the champion athlete throughout the whole thing. And so the, 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 the diversion, any wind, any, any interruption, was, he was protected at all times by this surrounding of, um, of, of, of other athletes. Um, and so some of these athletes, some of them ran up to three stages, but every single lap, there was a transition. And one of the amazing things was that those transitions were often absolutely seamless. If you didn't watch out for it while you were watching this two-hour event, you didn't realize that suddenly you'd look up and suddenly there was a different set of athletes um, you know, running with them. The interesting thing also about the leadership. So each team had its own leader. Elliot Kipchoge wasn't the leader of any of the teams. He was the person doing the um, breaking the barrier. But every, every team had its own leader and they had a special transition. I mean, where the leader ran was he ran at the bottom of the V in front of, in front of Elliot Kipchoge, closest to the champion, but also not in the front, in a sense, in the middle. And I think that's challenging some of our leadership connotations is are we are we leading just out there in the front leaving people behind or are we leading from the middle of the structure understanding how the whole thing works as you can see there were also pacing lasers and um, because the key thing about this attempt was absolute meticulous consistency um, every single remember I, I said earlier every single kilometer had to be run in two minutes and 50 seconds and you'll see the consistency a little bit a little bit later um, but to do that there was a, a car that obviously was tracking the time tracking everything tracking the distance and so all the runners had to do in a sense is they had to follow the mark um, follow the mark in other words they determined up front what the mark should be you can also see from this this photograph that the the channel of running was defined very clearly and around those big circles the channel of running was defined they couldn't go outside of that, um, but that provided them with the with the the the, the space to the zone to run in to achieve it. Things like hydration. Hydration was from a bicycle. They didn't stop and pull off. Um, and the coach, actually the chief coach, rode the entire distance to hydrate um, Elliot and the team as they as they went. And they allowed for the crowd. And that was, as we said, one of the significant things that was that was that was reflected um, beforehand. And the key thing about the structure is that it was absolutely consistent throughout the entire race. As I mentioned, watching it, you thought, aren't those the same people running? And yet they would change all the time. So every nine kilometers, every six to nine kilometers, there would be a transition of team. And so you the names and the faces changed. Um, some would appear two or at most three times, some only ran, ran once, but all of them were running, not for themselves, but for someone else. And so what was really interesting is that if you look at the implementation, it was absolutely meticulous and measured, as I've mentioned. The transitions had to be completely seamless. They had to be, you know, unnoticeable almost. And this is where we need to really start thinking about our own businesses. What elements, what areas in our businesses do we need to do better, measure better, transition better? The absolute consistency, as I mentioned, the fastest kilometer, so the target was two minutes and 50 seconds per kilometer for 42 kilometers. The fastest was 248, the slowest was 252. It was an absolute balance. Um, if you look at some of the, some of the splits, um, you know, some incredible splits there. You know, they're 20 kilometers in 56 minutes. Every single five kilometers in 14, in under 15 minutes, 14 minutes and 10 seconds. I mean, that is incredibly fast. Um, a stat of interest is that internationally, there have been over 51 million park runs. So park run is something, it's a five kilometer timed run all over the world. Only five attempts at the park run have been run at faster than the 14 minutes and 10 seconds. And he ran. 42 kilometers at that pace. Um, you can just see some of the splits. And again, the absolute consistency that flowed through the entire, the entire attempt was, was, was amazing to, to watch. Um, and then obviously there was this incredible celebration and success. I was very moved by the way that in the last 400 meters, the team opened up and Elliot Kip Kipchoge ran, ran forward. It was an incredibly moving event and something that you can if you haven't seen it and in preparing for this webinar, I, I looked at it again a few times and it's just incredible how, you know, just, despite 
the speed at which he was running, there was still energy. And there, you can see also the celebration um, behind him because it was a recognition that they'd played a part in breaking an incredible, an incredible barrier. And so with that in mind, what I want to do is shift a little bit and change gear a little bit and say, well, what does that then mean for us? What can we learn from this incredible, incredible attempt? What can we learn about our strategies? What can we think about? And in a sense, this part of the webinar is merely just to leave you with a set of questions um, that I encourage you to take into your teams, engage with your teams, engage with your, your um, you know, those people in your business or wider than your business, maybe even your external team, your stakeholders, other parties who are interested, involved in your business. Um, what can you, we, we learn about the structure, the strategy, the team, what did they learn and the structure as we, as we, as we go forward as well. Um, and I encourage you as we go, the last part of this, um, please ask any questions um, and any thoughts on your mind, please share with me as we, as we go. Um, the strategy. So, let's look at our own businesses. Let's look at what we're facing at the moment. And obviously what we're facing at the moment has put up significant barriers. There are, there are new things we've never ever had to contemplate or think about. Um, a metaphor that I often have used in this last couple of months is that what we're facing is not a, t, uh, a crossroads. We're facing a T-junction. You know, the world ahead, there is no road ahead based on the road that was behind us. We have to make significant decisions. And for some of our businesses, that's going to be asking the question, well, what is the barrier that you need to break through or smash? Do you need to, in this time, deepen your promise, rethink your purpose in your business? Because possibly your products and services are no longer as compelling, no longer able to be sold. They don't necessarily have the value that was, was originally Seen, seen in them. Do you need to, instead of abandoning that, do you need to rethink the elements of your business from a strategic, from a strategic point of view? Do you need to rethink your purpose in the business? Do you need to rethink your vision? Um, and again, some of the other webinars we've done will help you unpack some of these things. Some ideas around, instead of looking at a single you know, strategic time horizon, which we've often done in the past, you know, we have our 2030 or 2025 vision, now's the time to ask the question, where do I need to be by the end of 2020? Where do I need to be by the end of 2021? Much like they had to map out every single kilometer along the road and know that if they weren't at two minutes, 50 seconds, every single kilometer of the way through the 42K attempt, they wouldn't be in a position to break, the, break that, that two, hour, two hour barrier. Um, is, it a, is it a people barrier that you're facing? Is it a motivation barrier? Have you had to make some decisions that really were difficult and you're feeling overwhelmed? Um, what does the barrier look like for you and your business? And I encourage you to take some time and to reflect on that in the time that lies ahead. What about your team? So what's your team's secret source or hidden genius? What is your team's combination of skills? So. Elliot Kipchoge chose 40 plus athletes who were all absolutely brilliant athletes in their own right. Um, what is the athletics team in a sense that you have in your business? He also chose back office, behind the scenes, experts on nutrition and physiotherapy and you know, medicine to help you know, go through that, go through that, that barrier as well. Um, do you have people in your business that, that are better than you? Um, a number of leaders um, from the likes of Richard Branson and Steve Jobs have both been quoted as saying, it's not about getting people that, that know what you know, it's getting people that know what you don't know. Um, and that's absolutely critical at the moment is who do you have in your team and who do you need in your team? And that's an incredible exercise. A couple of the, the clients I've worked with over the last few weeks have said that this has been an interesting opportunity to re-engage with their teams at a deeper level. It often started with them reaching out to their teams and saying, we're all going through terrible times. We want to look after you. We want to you know, help you get through this overwhelming time. But the result of that is it changed some of the organizational culture elements. And so they're saying, how do we, how do we make use of that going forward? And it's really getting the team to 
input and to provide insight into the way the way ahead. Even you know, recently, a client that has that has battled the crisis has has, has revealed some really negative things in the business, um, and they've used that as an opportunity to reconsolidate the balance of the team. They've had to get rid of a couple of people um, for for criminal reasons, um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they are saying, "How do we use that so that we can continue to unpack, untap?" the hidden genius of, of, of our teams. And I always say that a team is more than just the individuals. A team is the combination. You know, it wasn't just the 41 athletes. It was their ability to run together, their ability to hold a pace as a team in a structure. And that was really critical to think about. So your team, do you have people around you that are better than you? Do you, have, do you know what's in your team? And if you don't, how do you find out? Maybe spending a bit more time trying to discover that secret source or that hidden genius in your team is a major priority going forward. Previous attempts, are there any other, you know, are there patterns, habits, ways of doing things that prevent you from, from moving, moving forward? You know, I think one of the big challenges um, for every business is that it's easiest to face the future in the way that we face the past. So remember the first attempt, 2017, We'll do a race. We'll still have pacemakers, but we'll race a few people against each other. Hopefully that will help break the barrier. Um, but it's been variously attributed to, very, to a whole lot of people. But there's that famous quote, insanity is to keep doing the same things and expect a different result. Um, and this is exactly what it is. And, and thanks, Tim, for your insight. You know, it's fascinating how much preparation and teamwork was involved in something as simple as a run. Exactly. You know, um, a big wake-up call. For us as a business, a business people is to put so much more effort into planning and preparing properly. And that's what it is, is thinking about how have we tried to do things in the past. Um, do you and your businesses reflect and learn? Do you do that systematically and consistently? Because I think the challenge is, there's two things. Firstly, we, we tend to slip into habits. We see it happening in the boardroom all the time, is that when board members arrive and they are not properly prepared or they're not properly engaged, the natural habit is to slip into what they're used to. So the discussion either goes operational because that's the experience of everybody, or it becomes an argument about value because they're mainly you know, shareholders. So people tend to slip into the habits. Some of us had to be you know, quite, quite structured in our time during lockdown. And I know a lot of people have said that the challenge with you know, what the world is going through is that time seems to merge, days seem to merge into, into one another. You know, the fact that it's a Friday for some people is, is, is a surprise all of a sudden. Um, but the challenge is, what we need to do is, how do, we, how do we break out of those habits and patterns? And there's a lot of books, ironically, in the last two or three years, there have been lots and lots of books about breaking habits, developing new habits and new patterns. And that's really one of the one of the challenges, We've, we can look back and learn. We can ask the question, what did we do? How did we do it? But recognizing that the way we do it into the future has to be different. If we're not learning from what hasn't worked going forward, then we're missing the opportunity. If you've had a really rocky start going into this crisis, reflect, what did you do well? What did you do badly? Because most businesses did a combination of things, some good, some not so, so good. So, the previous attempts in your business at remember this barrier, we have this barrier um, to, to, to overcome or, or smash. And then it's thinking about the planning. Um, and here again, just a series of questions that I want to want to pick up on. Are you clear about all the elements involved? Um, so some of the curveballs from the previous attempt were things like the, the power of the crowd. Um, and Elliot Kipchoge saying, I need the crowd. I can't run behind closed doors and hope to break this, this, this barrier. Do we understand the comprehensive view of all of the different parts of the business and how they are related or interrelated or impact one another? And so the, the governance view on a business, the, the high level view on a business, the view from the boardroom in a sense is of the entire business, not only of the parts, but also of the relationships. Because governing is not just about bits and pieces. It's about how we link the bits and pieces together so that they function effectively going forward. And some of our businesses have been seriously challenged. The, some areas of our business that may have been the strongest could right now be the weakest. 
some of the areas that were you know weak may now actually be the strong areas we need to step back and understand and it's called complexity thinking systems thinking do we understand the complexity of not just our business but also the external environment remember that they had to take into account and they chose an environment that they could they could work in so the external environment is obviously trickier that's why the way they handle that is they had a window period. Sometimes we, we, we push ahead with a, a, an objective and a timeline irrespective of what's happening out there. That's maybe not the wisest thing to do. Maybe we can choose some parameters that will indicate when the time is right and know what to look for. Um, I've been involved over the years in businesses and you think this is fantastic. You go ahead and it falls flat. And then a year later, somebody else runs with almost the same idea and makes buckets of money and you think well, what happened and it was a timing issue timing is also important as part of this so all of the dimensions of external environment internal environment timing issues um, those are things we need to think about as as leaders focus do you keep the main thing the main thing there was clear and absolute crystal clear focus on the barrier and obviously Part of me says, and this is also what people say, is, you know, what is a two-hour barrier? It's 60 minutes, 60 seconds each. Why is that a barrier? Well, in a sense, if we think about it, it's a, it's a made-up barrier. It, it doesn't really exist. Like the four-minute mile doesn't really exist. But what it does do is it gives us focus. And so sometimes we've got to think about what will compel us to aim for something higher than we've aimed before. What barrier do we have to create? Um, and what barrier does our whole team buy into? Because the, the incredible thing about things like athletics and um, the Olympics is everybody accepts that there are these barriers. There's a buy-in. All the athletes accept them. All the crowd accept them. And everybody wants those barriers to be, to be broken. And so it's, it's not just as a, as a leader in your business saying this is what the barrier is. It's getting something that will focus all of our attention on exactly the same thing. Because that's what gave the buy-in to the whole team. They were all focused on exactly what they needed to do. They all knew exactly what they needed to do um, in order from the transitions, from the running, from the being ready at the right place at the right time to focus on a singular barrier. And I think that's one of the challenges. Too often I've seen businesses try to, try to or teams in businesses identify a whole lot of different things. Um, five or six or seven or eight strategic priorities. And I often say the most we can handle is probably a handful. And by that, I mean less than five. And actually, if we focus on one or two or three things, we'll probably accomplish more than if we focus on five or six or seven things. And so the clearer the focus in your business, the much better it is for, for everybody involved. So do you keep the main thing, the main thing? Do you know what it is? And do you keep it that? Structure. Is the structure well designed? So again, looking at the attempts. The first attempt, not great structure to deliver the, 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 the purpose. Um, is the structure fit for purpose? Um, and I suppose this is the ongoing challenge of business, is that as environments change and as technology changes, we need to keep rethinking and redesigning our businesses is it designed to deliver the breakthrough you know again that quote do you keep doing the same things and expect a different result if you want a different result you've got to do things differently you've got to design differently if you want to break that barrier you've got to think differently the classic example around the four minute mile was that um, roger bannister was a medical student and the medical convention Conventional understanding at that day was it was physically impossible that a man's heart would explode. And he said, I don't think so. He said, I think I can do it. And so he approached it and his planning, etc. The same way the planning was done for this event. It was fit for purpose. The design of everything from the shoes, which have become famous, the, the Nike shoes, um, the, the, the structure of the run, the environment, the plotting on the ground, the lasers, the distance of the cars, all of those things were meticulously designed to fit the purpose. So in your business, have you designed things with a fit for purpose in mind? The implementation, so there's the planning. Have you thought through and designed well? Implementation, is it meticulous? Does everyone know exactly what they need to do? There's no confusing 
communication, there's no misunderstandings. And so a critical thing is communication. Does everybody know what every what the same words mean? We find sometimes in our team that the same words are used to mean different things or different things are used to mean the same, you know, different words are used to mean the same thing. And that's a common challenge. I've often come across that when I've done in a facilitation and you I listen and I think well actually everybody's saying the same thing but they're just using different words and so the argument it doesn't even exist um, are you clear about what has been communicated um, and 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 this is the danger it's you know the problem is we often withdraw from communication because we don't want to over communicate um, but it's finding the right balance in every single team um, and does every team know what every team is accountable for at the, at the end of the day? Because communication leads to meticulousness. I know that's a strange word, but I think that's one of the things we need to, because businesses consist of lots of moving parts. It's, it's not only like an engine that has to fit together, but the way that the engine of our business works is it works with communication. The oil of our engine is communication um, because we're checking continually where people are at. You watch any team sport, a team that works is a team that communicates, and that's absolutely critical to being meticulous in our implementation. Is the team well matched? I mean, does their skill set match what's required of them? I mean, does, does their skill set, and what I mean by that is, does their match do what is required for the barrier? All right. Um, there were 40 plus athletes. They all did inc do incredibly well at their areas, but they were incredibly capable. Again, walking into a team in a business, you should be able to recognize clearly the ones who are far better at you than what um, is, is, is required. But everybody needs to together, you know, work together because it's not only about the individuals, it's about what the team is able to do. It's not just the individuals, it's the relationships and the links. So what is the team's capability? What is their capacity? Is the team the right size? Are there enough to do what is necessary? Are they, you know, if, if there had been four and not seven runners, would there have been a breakthrough? We don't know. Probably not. All right. Um, if there had been nine and not seven, again, we don't, we don't know because it wasn't done with us. But have you thought about the right team size? Because one of the challenges in our businesses is that when things start going wrong, we automatically or we jump to blaming the individuals and we say you're not capable. Whereas I think more often than not, it's probably a capacity issue. The people are too busy, they've got too much on their plate, they're not able to focus. And so if you have this, this picture again of the machine or the engine of the business, the, the challenge is as the environment has changed and the business requires different things, so different parts of the business are going to be under strain in different ways. Um, and so it's matching the skill set to the right place. So are there enough of the right people in the right places in your business to do the right, the right things? Um, often what I call the challenge of the weakest link. In businesses, we identify the weakest link, we fix it. We don't then recognize that something else has now become the weakest link. And that is not necessarily something alongside the previous weakest link. It's somewhere else in the business. And so growing and building and developing and cultivating a business is about continually working to make sure that we have both capability and also capacity. And then does your culture enable the performance? Um, and again, going back to that team, going back to the celebration, everybody that was there, not for themselves, they were there for the goal and the barrier and Elliot Kipchoge. Um, he was able to take the glory, but he knows, and he's been incredibly open with acknowledging that every single, that his accomplishment wasn't just his accomplishment, it was the entire culture that, that I mean, imagine if, imagine if one or two of those athletes actually wanted to do it themselves. And so they insisted on being on every single team instead of saying, I can run one or two of the six or seven legs that were being, that were being run. Um, imagine if someone said, no, no, I want to be on every team. They would have dragged it down. Instead, there was a culture that facilitated and enabled. There was a culture of, of excellence. There was a culture of, you know, working together. There was a culture of waiting for the right time. So in the planning and in the implementation. And so in, in our organizations, we have capable people, we have enough of them, but sometimes things don't work because of the culture that disables our businesses. And so sometimes we look at it, it's, it's often difficult, but we need to recognize that 
if we don't have an enabling culture that is matched to the structure which is matched fit for purpose for the for the objective there's a whole lot of things that need to align and that's why complexity is an important thing to think about in our in our businesses um, and then lastly in the implementation is it measured remember the lasers remember the speed that was monitored there were targets there were there was a specific pacing um, and it was made easy for them. I mean, the laser literally shone a line in front of the first runners and they just had to run on that line. In other words, the measurement system made the business, made the performance easy. And, and this is often the challenge in our businesses is we don't match the ease of, ease of use in our systems to the performance. It becomes a challenging, clumsy thing to measure and monitor and all of these extra things in our in our businesses we've got to design systems that are easy because easy systems mean the people who are good at what the people do can excel and do well at what or what they do the more clumsy our systems the more challenging is it is for people to actually perform in our businesses does everybody know where they need to be by when all right does the pasting match the objective have you also looked at it? Because for, for me, what was, what was um, amazing is that every single one of those athletes um, could have run a kilometer in quicker than two minutes and 50 seconds. Every single one of them. All right. But they weren't allowed to because if they ran too fast, they wouldn't have achieved the objective. Obviously, they could have all run slower. That's the opposite. Okay. But ultimately, it's about matching the pacing, the measurement to the objective. And are people accountable for that? So are people taking accountability in our, in our systems as we, as we go forward? And so these are just some thoughts in terms of saying, well, let's think about, as we said, let's, let's think about, you know, our strategy. What can we think, what can we, what can we learn from the barrier that we, that we face? This incredible barrier of the two hours, 42.2 kilometers in under two hours, a phenomenal athlete um, who gathered a, a team around him to, to, you know, facilitate the breaking of this barrier rethought from previous attempts learned from the past and said how do we do it better we did not just replicating everything from the way it was run to where it was run it all changed a lot changed um, in, in in the second the second or third attempt and then the structures we put in place and it's not just about the designing the planning the thinking about the structures it's also about the implementation of the of the of the structures and so it's really as i said right at the beginning is when we look at what we're going through at the moment are we and i encourage you if you've got any last thoughts or comments please drop them into the chat box of the the q a box but it's really thinking of as we look back the future is very very different from what the past has been but it doesn't mean we can't learn it doesn't mean we can't see what people are good at in our teams it doesn't mean we can't look at reconfiguring our businesses so we can renew it but the the bridge between reviewing where we are and what we've done and renewing into the future making decisions about as i said which of these you know the forks in the road there's no straight ahead that lies ahead we have to reimagine we have to think about we have to build up an incentive an inspiration in ourselves and in our in our team identify some of those barriers um, that we need to that we need to to address and so with that in mind i want to go back to the the celebration photo because if i believe that that we can we can accomplish we can break the barrier then we also need to celebrate and and rest in 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 our in our celebration and you know the success of this one man who in himself is an incredible phenomenal athlete but in breaking this barrier wasn't just about him it was about the people that were willing to work with him. It was about the structure that he was willing to work within. All right. Everything from the technology to the formation was all designed. And then it wasn't only designed well, it was also implemented well. And so in the team, there were some who designed, some who implemented, and some who did, who did both. Um, but I trust that that's been an interesting, insightful challenge and i encourage you when you look at what's happening use the things you're interested in for me it's just, it's 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 running and i'm fascinated because i've attempted some of these distances and they're not not easy to um to do themselves but as you look at the world around you um be it nature 
there's a lot we can learn in governance and structure from trees and you know the way the way nature works there's a lot in you know the relationships that we've been stuck in in our families and our friendship circles which have been challenged how how do we learn from those to also help improve improve our businesses as we as we go so thanks so much for taking the time to join um thanks very much for some of the the, the engagement um and please get in touch with us um, if you are needing either you know, input, training, education, or inspiration. The way forward is something that we all need to explore, explore together. So I'm gonna sign off and please complete the survey that is gonna um, come on your screen as soon as I sign off. So thank you very much for taking the time. All the very best, have a great weekend.